friends, and welcome to Freedom Harvest Farms, gardening with Aislinn and my bud Joe on the back. My bud Joe. What's up, bud? <laughs> my partner Joe is on the back. You guys already know that. And today, I want to start out by saying, Happy Halloween, the witch is in. <laughs> it is so much fun this time of year for me because I really do get into the costumes. I'm not a huge fan of all of the events and all the parties and all the things, but you can always catch me in some silly socks, a funny hat, all year long. So of course, when Halloween comes out, everybody thinks that my hair is a wig and things are all silly and funny. But mostly what I like to do is just put on a fun show and get dressed up and just enjoy life. And that's a great time of year that we have going on here. But even better than that for me, the gardener, and for you, the gardener as well, is that it's the time of year when we are now really entering our first early harvests from the things that have begun to be available to harvest from this after the summer and the things that we put in early in September and we are continuing to plant every single day. I want to be very clear about the fact that this is just the beginning of the planting season if you live in zone 9 or zone 9B, which is a little bit closer to the coast than where I am right now, and in the South Texas region, okay? So I hear a lot of people saying, I'm trying really hard to get my stuff planted, but it's almost too late. No, 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 no. Wipe that from your mind. It is not too late. It is only the beginning. It's too late in July. That's when it's too late. And we've got a lot of time ahead of us to get a lot of things planted. Now, one thing you do need to understand, which could have potentially created this misnomer that it's too late to plant, is the rest of the country, it is getting too late to plant. And in addition to that, because we get to the point where we have very short daylight hours, in the summertime, things grow really fast because they've got a whole like 12 hours of sun, right? And it's all very intense sun. But as we enter in to the late fall winter season, we start to have very short daylight and we start to have less warmth, okay? So what that means is things will, will grow slower. So you have to give longer periods of time for things to really get developed and to get their stronger growth growing. But this time of year where we are right now, we are still dealing with a lot of warmth which is nice, means we're, a lot of our seeds are gonna continue to germinate, and we still have a lot of daylight that's going to happen. We also have nice big harvest moon moonlight. And those times of the year, you will actually, those times of the month, you will actually see a little bit more growth. We will actually see also this time of year, the convergence of shifts in weather, which will make a lot more rain and moisture. So all of those things means we have a lot more moisture, we have cooler temperatures, and we still have a good solid eight hours of sun. So that means we can grow this time of year, and we can grow a little bit of everything this time of year. We've got those tomatoes that are still on the vine. They're starting to set beautiful green tomatoes. All your cherry tomatoes are starting to pop. All of those types of things are happening. Your pepper plants are going crazy right now with ridiculous amounts of peppers. All those early radishes are starting to pop. All of that kind of stuff. Our okra is setting again so we can harvest from our okra. We are now beginning to see lots of mustard greens. And then let's talk about right now what we're actually putting in the ground from direct sowing, which means what are the seeds I'm actually putting in the ground right now. So let's start with that. In November, I direct sow. I continue to direct sow all of my flowers and my bulbs. If you're gonna do like more northern climate bulbs like daffodils and tulips and things like that you need to make sure that you give those a little pop in the refrigerator before you put them in the ground this is what nurseries do in order to make sure that when you purchase the bulbs they will plant the first season so that's something to keep in mind every year you need to make sure that your bulbs have got a pop so that they can have kind of a trick that gets them to go ahead and green and then bloom because they will green regardless. It's the bloom you're looking for and it's that pop. So bulbs 
and flower seeds can go in the ground and continue to go in the ground through the rest of this month. All those na native wildflowers, keep putting those in the ground through all of November. This is our blue bonnets. This is all of our beautiful um, beneficial flowers that we just tend to plant all around. Um, okay, so then we're, then we're also getting continuing to do our root vegetables. So of course that's your carrots, your radishes, your turnips, your beets. Your beets are gonna start to do a little bit better right now because this is the time of year when we do begin planting our soft leaf things. So your beets, your Swiss chard, those things can go in the ground and they'll have a little bit more luck right now. You also wanna to continue to do your allium seeds. Now your allium seeds are your onion and garlic seeds. And what you're trying to do is get yourself to the point of what you would be getting in the mail if you ordered them from a company, which I did, Dixondale Farms. They are a Texas company, Carrizo Springs. And I order my short day onions, the little tiny bulbs from those guys. And they're gonna be in here in the next couple of weeks. And that's when you start putting those bulbs in the ground, as soon as you can get a hold of them. But if you're plant direct sowing seeds, this is what you're doing right now is direct sowing those seeds for green onions, your shallots, your chives, leeks, if you're still doing leeks, any of that kind of stuff, those seeds are going in the ground right now as well. And then now we are getting into our leafy greens, our soft leafy greens. So now is when I will begin putting in my lettuce, my spinach, more Swiss chard, more beets, I will also start putting in my nasturtium flowers. Those are a really good edible flower. They're spicy, their leaves are spicy. They like the cooler temperatures, but they don't like the freeze. So if we get a really hard freeze again this year, you might lose them and then you go ahead and replant them again after that. But they do like this cool season and they're, they were mixed in with what would be considered your salad greens. Your mustard greens, mustard greens can usually go in a little bit earlier because they're a little more bitter and the bugs don't like them as well but they definitely can go in this time, this time of year. Kale, of course, you might have already been doing some kale, but now heavy, heavy kale. So now is hard hitting our leaf, leafy greens this time of year. Now, what are we sowing indoors? This is your little tiny greenhouse that you have or some little space you have inside that you're going ahead and getting your seeds started inside so that you can take those transplants and put them outside. Those are all of our herbs and flowers. So that's the chamomile, the bachelor button, hollyhock, lavender, calendula, pansy, snapdragon, stalk, echinacea, lemon balm, sage, thyme, oregano. This is when you do all of these. Now, one thing I've told a lot of you guys, and I wanna rem remind you yet again, that is that a lot of the herbs and flowers that you would do indoors like this, they need to be, or even if you did them outside, they need direct sunlight in order to germinate. So not only do they need the moisture and the connection with the soil, but they also need direct sunlight. So these are the things that you just sprinkle on top. You've got, if you're doing them in little pots, you sprinkle them on top of the pot, you give them a nice little misting. If you're doing them out in the garden, you go ahead and just sprinkle them on top of whatever section you want them to come up in, and then you just give them a nice water at least once a day, sometimes twice a day if you have the availability to do that. Those things will do much better because they require light. And these are all things that I've learned over the last few years with my hands in the dirt and playing with different types of seeds and figuring out which seeds do the best. Now, you're also starting your, um, your, all your stocking vegetables. Those can be started indoors. Celery, celery is gonna start doing a lot better right now because the temperatures are starting to cool down. Of course, Swiss chard. I actually don't have a ton of luck with planting Swiss chard indoors and then getting it to the outside. So I go ahead and direct sow most of my Swiss chard. Artichokes, you can continue to start those indoors. All your brassica vegetables, that's your broccoli, your cauliflower, your cabbage, your kale, those types of things all getting started indoors. Now I'm transplanting any herbs and flowers. I mentioned all those herbs and flowers that I'm starting by seed. Those things are now starting to go out into the garden, my little baby plants. If you're buying them from the nursery, continue to keep buying these particular things and planting them in November. Those are your also, in addition to all of those beautiful herbs I mentioned, like the chamomile and lavender and all of that stuff, you're also doing, again, those stocking vegetables. Right now is a good time to get your celery in the ground, your Swiss chard, your asparagus, your artichoke. And of course, those brassica vegetables, like I mentioned before, it's a great time to get your nursery starts or your own starts out in the garden now. That's the broccoli, the cauliflower, the Brussels sprouts, the cabbage, and of course, all of those bulbs of 
leeks, chives, onions, elephant garlic, anything you can get. You're gonna start to see that stuff at our local nurseries within the next few weeks. And if you're ordering it, they're gonna get it to you in the next week or so. One thing I noticed the other day, I was at Turner's and they actually already had some bunching onions available for purchase. I was like, yes, I was super excited about that. It looked at like they were getting them from a, a local guy, a, lo a local some? family. Do what? Did you buy some? I did. They're ever evergreen bunching onions. They're in a little they're in a little green bag right there by the front door where you would normally find onions and potatoes there at Turner's. They've got them already available there, but be sure you know that we are not planting long day onions. Look at when you go to any if you go to a box store, if you go to the nurseries, any of that kind of stuff, we're not planting anything that says long day. We want all short day and then we can do some of those evergreen bunching and green onions, those types of things. Why it, is that? It, they take too long. The amount of cold weather in order and then the amount of a long, cool summer, we just don't have that kind of weather. Is that a situation where those box stores are, are bringing in product that work quote unquote all over the country but don't necessarily work here too Absolutely. well? Absolutely. And you yeah. guys have all heard me do a little bit of complaining about what the box stores are bringing down here and most of the time it's not stuff that's really timed or well prepared for us we what did we need to grow down here on dinner table talks look yes. for, look just a few weeks ago within the last few weeks look up the title god i wish home depot would hear this or something god i wish home depot would hear this on dinner table talks right you look up that episode you go into that at length yeah. i go into that at length he's right i go into my whole um karen called customer service moment in life <laughs> um here i am sitting at something we've done just recently we're super excited about because we have a lot of events coming up in uh at the farm here in the next few weeks on november the 15th we have herbs for health that's coming up that is 44 dollars a car load I'm, I'm welcoming about 11 cars i've already got several cars that have purchased so if you're interested in getting in on the herbs for health go ahead and grab yourself a ticket then see uh, how many friends can help divide up that 44 dollars I'm, I'm saying fill your car up with seven. Come on out. We're excited. If you've got room for seven, don't put people in the trunk. That's a terrible idea. Strap them to the hood. <laughs> Strapping people on top. Yeah, like no, a deer. No, no, no. <laughs> like a deer. But we've got that coming up on November the 15th. And then on number tw November the 20th, we have a second uh, educational workshop happening. Same price, $44 a car load. That's going to be beginners gar edible gardening in South Texas. I'm going to be doing those once per month. Those are coming up as well. And then the Long Lunch Club is on November the 3rd. It is actually sold out this time, but the next one's coming up on December the 30th. Put it on your calendar, plan a long lunch. We look forward to having you out here. And this is the fall decoration. You can see we did our cool little old school, old school implement. This is a cedar, a, actually a planter. You would put this on the back of a tractor and you would fill it with your seeds. And then it helps you plant your, your seeds out in a big field. But we've done, filled it up with, um, beautiful mums and we put some pumpkins and we're gonna do a jack-o-lantern today no I did not grow any of these pumpkins however I did grow a lot of pumpkins this year and I am motivated after spending a lot of money on giant beautiful pumpkins to grow even more pumpkins for all of us out here next year now let's head over to my garden up here in the front and let's talk about what I've been doing in terms of planting and harvesting and weeding this hat is not made for people to wear for real, actually. This is a pretend hat, and what I need to do is find a real witch hat so that I can actually wear it. Oh, look at my monarch. Zip. Okay, so go here real quick. This is sweet potatoes. This was, was two rows of maybe like seven split, splits. I can't use, that's not even the right word. I'm um, slips, that's the word. My brain wouldn't come up with it. Slips seven of them slips are the little like starts that already have a little bit of roots coming down on them i planted those in this is what i have right now when i get ready or when we have the first freeze and it knocks these plants out i can then harvest sweet potatoes out of this garden of course you can see the okra and the celosia and all of those types of things that are doing really well i actually have some celosia that's going to a wedding here in the next couple of weeks i'm very excited about that because that will be my first time to really get into doing that kind of thing and being able to provide cut flowers for a wedding as well. Okay, so what am I doing right here? I'm going through this really slowly. Let's see, if you go right there, you might be able to catch me coming back this way pretty easily. Okay, so what I've got, look, there's a cantaloupe right there. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. 
So those were actually um, volunteer cantaloupes that um, when my cantaloupes, you know, when something got into it or just sat out here too long, this garden was really well overgrown during the summertime. I had vines going everywhere. And those then melons will just drop down. Sometimes you don't get a hold of them before a critter gets them or they just get a bad spot. And then I leave the seeds in my permaculture style garden out here. And so then what happens is they tend to volunteer in the fall and they come up. Look, there's one even right there. You can see that that plant is putting on sun here, there, but this here. And then right here, you can see that this, this is putting on, right? Yeah, so yeah, they're everywhere. Yeah. Isn't that fun? And that's just the, that's the permaculture style right there. That's how that works. Okay, so what I'm doing over here is I'm going through these two rows, one on both sides of me, and I'm literally pulling all of my weeds out. Now I know that that takes some time. It takes some learning to really get a really good understanding of when a tiny, tiny plant is, um, is sprouting, is it a weed or is it something I wanna live in, leave in my garden? So I'm gonna put this in here about that okay so if you look right here I can see that of course that's a weed that's pretty easy to tell that that's a weed and then you can tell right here that's a weed and I am, am going through and hand harvesting and I have a lot of gardens to work in and I'm still doing it this way because what's gonna happen is I'm gonna have more production in smaller spaces because I've done the tending the day-to-day -day tending of what's needing to happen in here so I can go through this I can also weed out my big radishes. If I see one that I'm real happy with in terms of size, we're about to make some pickled stuff for our um, event on, t on Wednesday, the uh, Long Lunch Club. So I'm gonna pull out these little pretty French breakfast radishes and give the rest of them a little more room to grow. You see I've got a little crowding right there. So yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and pull that one out. That would be maybe what I would call thinning. Currently, that's the thinning style I'm doing. You can see that I've got some cilantro, some cilantro. I've got some alyssum growing over here, but I've also got a weed right here. So I'm gonna pop this one out. But look, it left the other plants around it just fine. So then once I do that, then I can go back through this bed right here, these two rows right here. And I've got my little pouch right here in front of me. And I've got one little thing. I use my old doTERRA, doTERRA bottles, but I got a little pop top lid and I can pour carrot seeds into my hands. Hmm. now. Why do my carrot seeds look different than your carrot seeds? These are pelleted carrot seeds. It means they put a coating on the outside of them to make it easier for me to pick them up and to just stick them in. You can see I had another one right there. Just push it down, no big deal. So I buy pelleted carrot seeds. Now, of course, if I'm buying just pretty generic brands, you know, the Burpee brands, all that, um, uh, Ferry Morris, all that kind of stuff, I'm pretty much just gonna have to go with what I have and do as much broadcasting as I can. But if I'm ordering from some of the my favorite seed companies, I'm able to buy pelleted seeds. I buy pelleted uh, celery seeds, I buy pelleted lettuce seeds, and I buy pelleted carrot seeds. So that's one of the things I'm planting. You can also buy pelleted Swiss chard and beet seeds. Let me show you what those look like. So here I've got Look, this is one of my supplement bottles, and I happen to, you can write on yours if that helps you with your memory, but I happen to know what I've got in here. So I threw in some of my Swiss chard seeds, and you see the Swiss chard seeds are kind of big. Now you can get these, you can get these pelleted as well, but I don't find it necessary for this particular variety. So I'm also putting in my Swiss chard. Now what I'm doing is I'm going with Swiss chard on this side and carrots on this side, just so that I can get more closely germination time, knowing that the carrots are all gonna come up mixed in here and I'm gonna be able to tell, okay, this is a carrot and this is an sweet alyssum and this is a radish. I can go through, this is a lettuce. How did I get a lettuce in there? Well, let me show you this. This is the other thing that I do. I take an old bottle, this one was old from last season, carrot, doesn't matter, I can write on it if I want to. Another easy lid to open. That's how they ship the seeds to you? Yes, because little, it's so much bottle. easier to hold your seeds in a container like this and that paper than all these paper things that I'm like, now I got all these packages, I'm shoving them all in all my pockets and everything. No, I've got these little containers like this. So then what's in here is that I've taken and made a ginormous bag of what I would consider fall seeds for planting. All my old seeds from last season, maybe even seeds from seasons before, 
Uh, anything that I collected on my own, so a lot of the lettuce that I collected out of the gardens and I collected and then spent the summer inside in the cool temperatures working on harvesting all my seeds and putting my seeds away, dill, cilantro, all of those types of things, bachelor buttons, all things I collected of my own, now they go into my nice fall coverage what I would call cover crop, what I would call just random seeds that I just need to fill in the holes because I want to make sure that I'm spending big truck to go and buy. Monarchs too. More tractors. <laughs> it's easy to get distracted like um, in up uh, squirrel. You oh, know, exactly, the, exactly. Oh, monarch butterflies playing. But I want to make sure that when I go through my rows, each time I go through my rows, there's more here that I want and less that I don't want. So I don't have quite as much to weed if I can start to begin to notice what are the things in here that I want planted. And this would be what I would then sprinkle. And I do a sprinkle of this because as I mentioned earlier, you want to make sure that some of your flower seeds get that germination on top. Seeds do not have to be planted directly in the soil in order to plant, to, to harp, to germinate. That's the word I'm looking for. So yeah, even, in, in if it even if it calls for poking it in the ground, you can, because that makes it easier. It means it stays where you want it to go. So let's see, maybe this sunflower is big enough to go in the ground directly, but I don't have to do that. I can just do that, right? If you consider how seeds naturally drop from a plant, they're rarely, if ever, Exactly. Into the ground. So what I do with this instead, because there's a mixture of all different types of seeds, is I just kind of fill in the gaps. After I've gone through and I've planted some more carrots, some more Swiss chard, and I'm just going to take my little thing here with all this mixture of all different types of marigold and radish and bachelor buttons and all kinds of things in there. And I'm just going to sprinkle those down inside there and kind of fill in that gap. And then after I do that, it's really important because now I know that these rows have seeds on them again. And you can tell that because you can tell where you've picked it clean. Because you can look at a garden, you can look at this row over here. Let's go over there for a second. You see I got my little, my little bucket here. I'm harvesting some mustard greens. I'm harvesting some radishes. Just kind of throwing stuff in this bucket right here. But you can look at these rows and you can tell that these have not been thinned or cleaned. But if you look at those rows, of course we're in the shadow again, but if you look at these rows, you can see the difference. That helps you to know, okay, those have probably all germinated or the ones that are gonna germinate this round or will germinate, have germinated. So I'm gonna go through and clean these rows. I'm gonna plant these. And then I know that these need to be good, good, good water, okay? I want to talk to you about timing of things, timing of harvest and timing of watering. If you are able to, and any day that you are able to, harvest and water in the morning, you are going to have the most delicious, nutritious vegetables if you harvest them early in the morning. You want to try to harvest them before the heat sets in. Because what happens with a plant is that when the heat sets in, it goes into protection mode. It pulls all of its delicious sugars down inside. Now, that's good for your carrots and things like that. Not so good for your greens and all your delicious Swiss chard and all of that. Mustard greens, all that stuff, you want to go ahead and get that stuff harvested in the morning. So your best bet for your most delicious fruits, your most delicious, uh, even your tomatoes, peppers, any of that kind of stuff, is going to be to harvest those things in the morning rather than in the evening. And also you're going to have your best bet with watering if you water in the morning rather than in the evening. But I also know that time sometimes works like that. I just wanted to give you those ideas about understanding the most way to get the most nutritious and delicious vegetables out of your garden is to try to get those things harvested before that sun really sets into the day. So that's something to keep in mind. And then we all know that the more watering we do in the evening just means that they sit there in kind of a wet, moist kind of space. And that's when things start to grow, the pests and pathogens and things like that start to grow. So if you can water that stuff in the morning, that gives it the day to dry out throughout the day. And then by the time the night settles in, 
um, that dew and stuff that's coming on is not that big of a deal. So you can see what's happening here. You can see that I'm now gonna go back through. These were all early planted rows that I'm now going back through and cleaning up again. This one was the first row that I planted in late August, early September. It has already been cleaned, like I'm cleaning these over here, and then replanted with turnips. And now you can see that my turnips are all coming back up inside of here. How do I know the difference between a turnip and a radish when I look at it like this? I don't. <laughs> I just know what I planted on this row. So those are some things that like you're not gonna know. I don't always know the difference between a mustard green and a radish as well, but you just kind of keep an eye on the plant as it gets a little bit more mature, and that's how you can begin to tell the difference in those in that particular type of variety type of variety. So you can see here when I mentioned that I did turnips in here, you can and then and then I told you that I had already planted something before that, so then I've got some, some things that are starting to germinate. So you can see, okay, turnips that germinated, carrots that are starting to germinate, some of the radishes that were already in there, some of the old potatoes that were already in there that I'm going ahead and just kind of letting them do their things. Here's a weed, here's a weed, here's a weed. So I can go back in there, I know now I can, but then over here, this, my big hat, you see that bright lime green leaf right there? That's lettuce. So what that is, is some of that mixture, that fall mix that had some lettuce in it that I tossed over the top, which gives me a little bit of pop of those earlier greens that, because I haven't officially started planting my leafy greens until November, the ones that I purchased this year. But that doesn't mean that I don't have some lettuce already coming up and that's working out really well. Do you feel that the coating, you know, when we see, um row after row after acre after acre of one crop when we drive through the country. Do you think that that's the kind of coating that confuses people into not realizing that you can take that seed mix like you showed us earlier and just throw all kinds of things together and it's okay for the radishes to be next to the turnips, to be next to the lettuce, to be next to the... and on and Yeah, on. I think the benefit of uh, having access to the entire world with the push of a button has shifted our ability to understand that you can grow differently. If you think about what our our grandmothers and our great grandmothers and our grandma, grandfathers and our great grandfathers were seeing and being taught. Number one, and we do talk about this on the podcast. I think it was last week. We talk about livestock commodity and 4-H. Mm -hmm. Well, vegetable commodity is really the same thing. What we were being taught was what the farmers were doing, and the farmers are are growing huge commodity production crops. So not only were we being taught that style, even though that's not the best style for small scale growers, but we also didn't have, we weren't seeing anything different. So there's definitely some coding and anyone that's just trying to grow the way their grandmother grew, that's what they're doing now is that they're trying to grow the way their grandmother grew because their grandmother grew in perfect rows and everything was the same and only vegetables went in this garden. Da, 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 da. However, somebody else's grandmother in Idaho or somebody else's grandmother in Australia or India or the Philippines or any of those other places was doing it completely different so they have a completely different set of coding and what they were doing was these smaller scale I've got a tiny little plot I don't have American systems of distribution with food that just shows up to a grocery store everywhere so I've got to grow food in this small little space so they were trained differently they were coded differently they were taught differently and so now we're starting to pick up some of those skills and in an area like South Texas, where it's kind of tropical, this is the best way for us to grow. And I believe it's the best way to grow pretty much all over the world, but I know it's the best way to grow in South Texas because that's where I grow and that's what I can see. And when I go look at what other people are doing, that's why you hear me saying, I learned that with my hands in the dirt because I can go see what someone else is doing, but until I give it a try here, even if someone never believe, even me, Never listen to someone tell you, you can't do that here until you've done it on your land, in your way of gardening, and it's not working. That's the only way you would believe that you can't do that here. And the reason is, is because, and even if you come up with that, you can still cheat the system. I say you can't grow garlic here. Well, you can grow garlic here, but you gotta, you gotta freeze it. You gotta give it some long season in the refrigerator and then put it in the ground and then it'll get to the point where it'll actually bulb or you will only have like the scapes or the, you know, the top parts of it. So that's the thing is that we're learning. We're learning now that we can, we can pretty much grow 
anything here if we know the timing, if we understand that we grow nine months to 12 months out of the year down here, if we understand when our rain comes, if we understand when our insects are a problem, which are the good guys, which are the bad guys. And I also want to just remind everyone that not only is this permaculture style of growing, well, it's permaculture style of growing and you would also add into the idea that I don't spray anything on these gardens. I don't spray organic chemicals. I don't spray non-organic or toxic chemicals. I don't spray anything out here. And the reason I don't is because nature's ability to create an ecosystem that manages itself is eight billion times cheaper and better than how Aislinn human can do it. And so what I do is I let them, the, I let the insects and the beneficials handle their own business in the garden, but I help. And the way I help is by giving all different types of life and life giving things out here. So when I talk about the mulch, that's that carbon. Carbon is sugar, we all know that. And sugar is what a lot of the plants are out looking for certainly what a lot of the perennials are looking for. It's definitely what the fungi is looking for. And the fungi creates the mycorrhizal fungi that is a network underneath the soil to that get helps the sugar your plants to the roots. get the sugar to the roots. But mm -hmm. annual vegetables are really looking for the minerals, the nutrients, the water, all of those types of things. And these are all our roads, our banks, all of those things that are happening underneath the soil. So everything I can do to it's like your own body. It's like your animals. It's the same thing. You got to give them food, water, sunlight, and you got to give them a microclimate that is best conducive to their ability to sustain their own health well and their own immune system well. Plants and animals and insects are very good at figuring out and evolving very quickly to solve a problem for their ancestors to keep growing. And the ones that are not healthy are going to die off. That's what's going to happen in nature. And it begins to take care of. But here's the thing that you need to understand about the time clock of nature, okay? The reason I try desperately not to spray anything, especially on a small, especially on a large broad scale area of any garden, is because every single time you kill the things in your garden, because you do a, 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 a pesticide, whether it's an organic pesticide or a toxic pesticide, it's still an insect killer. And what that does is it kills all the insects. And when it kills all the insects, think about this. The pest is going to multiply very, very fast, much faster than the beneficial no matter what type of thing you're talking about. If you're talking about a beneficial bacteria or a beneficial uh, fungi or whatever, or whether you're talking about a beneficial insect or whether you're talking about a beneficial flower, the beneficials feast on what would be considered the pest, okay? So the beneficials can't get fat and happy and strong if they don't have a lot of pests to eat. So the pests grow fast and they eat all of your vegetables and then you finally get the beneficials to start growing because again. Because the buffet is large enough for them. The buffet is now large enough for the beneficials mm -hmm. to get strong enough to build and make babies and all of that kind of stuff. So every single time you kill, you start your time clock over again. And you're going to get another hit by the pests again. So the best thing you can do is to watch your gardens, kill them with your fingers if you have to, pull out infested plants if you have to, let the nature solve its own problems and it will. All right, that's all I have to say to you guys today. I think we'll just make a nice little pass down the garden so you can show everybody. Oh, I do wanna make sure I show you guys all my beautiful little nursery planting things I'm doing here. You can see a beautiful row like this. You can get some calendulas, some broccoli. I got some Brussels sprouts, some beautiful purple cabbages, snapdragons, uh, some, I forget what that one's called. It's a flower basil. I've got all kinds of pretty stuff growing over here. And this is not only attractive for my in insects, beneficial insects, but it's also attractive for me and you because we all want to be a part of this and we want to learn and we want to have great opportunities to grow out here. So this is all the things I have going on in the garden. Monday morning is the launch of Dinner Table Talks. As usual, we are into season three and I think we're on episode nine. Sounds right. Nine this time. 
lots of stuff going on in the kitchen. We are finally starting to make ourselves more comfortable at home here in our new home at the farm. And we've got all of those events coming up over the next few weeks. You'll also be able to find me at the Portland Farmer's Market on November the 6th and at the Rockport Farmer's Market on November the 3rd, 12th, I think it's the 12th, November the 12th. And then you'll be able to find me again at the Corpus Christi Downtown Farmer's Market, Grow Local Farmer's Market um, on December the 1st. Lots and lots of things going on. I'm going to be busy. I look forward to connecting with you all. If you need anything, including a nice place to take some fall photos or some winter photos, or anything you're trying to do as your seniors like mine are about to be graduating, uh, your college seniors are about to be graduating as we move through their beautiful holiday season. If you're looking for a nice outdoor place to do some photographs, not only do we have a nice little setting over there where you can do some photos over there, we also have lots of space out here in the gardens with beautiful flowers and lots of beautiful pictures and trees and things that you can do. So reach out to me. One last thing, this farm is officially open for us to be able to do some gatherings here so if you're putting on a conference a small workshop small things small conference small workshop a small wedding small memorial for someone any of those types of things reach out to me and let me figure out how to get you in here so that we can host you at this lovely farm to host your beautiful event i love you all happy halloween have fun whatever you're doing this evening or even tomorrow i know that the um case space art center downtown corpus christi is going to be hosting their uh, the dia de los muertos art exhibit go check that out i love you all have a fantastic time i'll see you soon